Well, uh, one, thing I, I, one thing I did want to say before we get on to um, the Japanese thing, because I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. We got, we got a couple of... Is that me? No, what is it? A, a, a couple of films which... Because one of the things in a pitch is showing you really understand the brand. You know, you know, in getting under the skin of the brand and the brand values. And I think it's a really hard thing to do. It's a really hard thing to do because you're, you're the newcomer and, oft, and the client knows the brand better than you know it. You're gonna have a, so I've, I, this isn't an example where, we, where, we, um, where we, we did it for a pitch. We, we did it after the pitch, after we'd won BMW. Um, but it was a really interesting exercise for me, which I've used subsequently. So I'm going to show you, f hopefully, two commercials. Uh, one is of a five series launch, and then afterwards we did it for BMW dealers to, uh, to show how the wrong way to promote the BMW brand. And this proved to be a really powerful way of um, teaching the BM you know, what the BMW brand was about. And the BM so I think, I think, I think. Oh, we got a crisis over there. <laughs> I, I tell you what, why don't I talk about the, the, the Japanese pitch? That'll I'm take worried me. we're building this Japanese story up so much, people might be disappointed. But to me, and I have heard this story um, a couple of times now, but the, to me this is... Uh, shall I stop? No, yeah, yeah we're we going to play it now. So this is the ordinary ad. You can fall asleep for this bit. That's the ordinary ad, and then to understand. It is here, the fabulous BMW 5 Series, and those fellows from the fatherland have really done the business. There are four fabulous wheels with matching tyres. There are fabulous mirrors incorporating BMW's rear view feature, which is unique. The computer design wheel arches have been specially bent. The rear windscreen is angled at a fabulous new angle, and the suspension has been lowered to make the suspension lower. The engine wouldn't be amiss sitting behind Emerson Fittipaldi, and the dashboard wouldn't look out of place on Concorde. There are fabulous seats and BMW's fabulous see-in-the-dark headlight system. Yes, they made the BMW 5 Series longer, they made it wider, and they made it lower, and they made it blacker than it was before. In fact, you could say it was the ultimate, ultimate driving machine. I just call it fabulous. So that's, you know, it's finding a way to do a version of that in the pitch to show you understand the brand and what the brand is. You do them with mood films now. And I think that's a really important part of a pitch. So we finally get onto this Japanese story. It's had this massive build up. To me, it does illustrate two things about you, Robin. One is that you do have, you alluded to earlier, and maybe it is why you're a good salesman and a good pitcher, a, a sort of slightly, uh, well, a very thick skin, and you're not particularly sensitive to, um, sometimes, to people's reaction to your full-on selling. Yeah. Um, and you never give up, as Debbie said, you're a Rottweiler. Mm, yeah. So tell us about this story. Well, it's, it was in our, you know, it, it was in our very first year. You know, we, it was 1979, so it, we, you know, we weren't that busy. And Peter, Peter said, look, it's a really great news because he'd been working on Kawasaki. Great news, he said. You know, we had a call from um, Mitsubishi, and they want to come in and see us. And I thought, oh, it's fantastic. Um, I didn't notice that the day they were coming in happened to be my birthday. Um, of July the 6th, so, uh, so fine. And then three or four days before the meeting, Peter said, look, um, 
I've been working with the Japanese, I've got to tell you, you know, this is how you have to do it. You know, we're going to have Japanese food, we're going to have some raw fish, all that sort of stuff. Um, when when uh, uh, Mr. Yamamoto's coming in, you know, when he ba you, you know, you're going to be, re meet when he bows, we have to match him in bowing. We mustn't, you know, if he, whatever level he bows to, we have to bow to that level, ideally a bit further. Um, and whatever happens, you must never, never put him in the wrong. Whatever he says, you have to agree. I said, fine, okay, got it, got it, got it, Peter. Um, anyhow, that morning, uh, there was some sort of decoy birthday present for me, you know, some boxing gloves or whatever. And when the time came at about 11, 12 o'clock, 11.30, Mr. Yamamoto arrived with sunglasses. And my job, you know, I was, was, to, was to greet him, so I went out to greet him. And, you know, I bowed to him, he bowed to me, and we were going at each other, hammer and tongs, <laughs> <laughs> like those sort of little birds you have in glasses. And you know, so I led him through to where Peter, Ron, and Andrew were inside this room. We, and we didn't have any advertising that we'd done. We had a table and we explained our concept. And then we started playing the old ads, the ads that Ron had done at Collitz or Andrew had done. And there was one ad um, that I'd done. So we start off, and all these ads are funny. And after every, uh, the first ads, the Japanese guy's immutable. And then there's another funny ad, I don't know, Heineken or whatever. And he says, so sorry, no understand. I said, I do apologize. This is a humorous commercial. I'm very sorry about that. So I then played another ad. And while I did all this, suddenly at one, um, who, was, who, who went first? Andrew suddenly rushed out of the room giggling. I thought, what on earth has happened? You know, you know Andrew, obviously, Japanese guy, you know, can't, you know. So I said to this Japanese guy, I'm really, really sorry. We won a very big client yesterday, and Mr. Rutherford's happiness was overflowed. <laughs> and I thought, you know, for this I was, you know, I was obviously bred for this moment to save the agency from extinction from a Japanese empire. And, and then a few minutes, you know, about 50 minutes on, Peter had the same thing. He burst out and giggled and charged out of the room. And I thought, I'm so sorry, Mr. Scott's happiness has also overflowed. Um, Ron, I didn't know this at the time, he, but he was, he, was, he, had, he was on the table with his, and he had a, a, a pencil, and he, he was pushing the pencil into his forehead so he didn't, um, so he didn't giggle. But however, you know, a bit more calmly, he left the room at some stage. So there I was, on my own, with Mr. Yamamoto, trying to, you know, hold the show together. You know, I thought, you know, this, you know, you know, we will, you know, this is the end of us. And, um, and then anyhow, there was, you know, a, there was one ad on the reel which I'd done, and it was an ad with the London Weekly Advertiser, which had Willie Rushton t taking the original large one, look and the new smaller one, and saying, "Oh, it looks like a cheap Japanese imitation." Well, <laughs> j fortunately, at the moment when he, that he was about to say that, I pressed the pause button. I said, "Mr. Amber, I'm very sorry. It's an, it's another humorous commercial. I'm I'm sure you don't want to see that. Let's go and have some lunch. We we've, we've arranged some rather nice raw fish." <laughs> so I went out, and there Peter had arranged, and, so, uh, and they'd all arranged a sort of dining room. There was this enormous raw cod. With, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a label at the bottom, which said at the bottom, gotcha. Um, but I was so wound up by this process, as you said, I, you know, I didn't pay any attention to that. And Peter thought, well, I better sort of put Robin out of his misery. And Peter said, look, you know, Robin, I think you should know that you know, Yamamoto is, in fact, a Japanese actor. And I, I said, I'm awfully sorry. Mr. Scott's happiness has overflowed again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, well, that was... That was uh, that's a Japanese <laughs> story. But you know, it's important to have fun in a pitch, isn't it? And I've heard several stories about you and your sort of pitch theatre. Yes, and, and actually well, sort of enjoying the whole thing. Well, I think this is the thing. We, we you know, we again, where we weren't doing creative, you know, we you know, we had a lot of fun, and we did we did pitch theatre and a, a good bit of pitch theatre, which which went wrong, but had a happy ending. And we were pitching for the Milk Marketing Board, and we were pitching against the, the pitching legend, actually. Should it, is Peter Marsh, that's one you should really get, because he was the pitching legend. And he rang up, he knew the guy, the Mick Marketing Board guy, and he called Steve Roberts, he said that Steve, I'm, and I, could I just, can you tell me where everyone's gonna be sitting around, there's like 16 farmers sitting around a boardroom, can you just give them a plasma and let me know where each one will be sitting? So Steve said, fine. So Peter Marsh didn't come to the pitch, he was on a video, 
And he then pointed at each person in turn around the table and said, and Mr. Jones, if you appoint Abbott, if you appoint um, Pete, um, Abbott, what the, uh, Alan Brady Marsh, thank you very much. Alan Brady and Marsh, this will happen to Milton, you know, this will be great. And so he was pointing to each, it's a brilliant pitch theater concept. So we went in after that with our creative idea and um, Andrew had written this line um, and we did a, because it was such an important thing, milk, you know, milk, uh, milk marketing board, you know, we want to win this. So we you know, dropped all our principles, of course. And, um, and we came up, you know, Andrew wrote this really nice campaign of, of lots of sort of older people um, running around on marathon and seeing the line, I bet he drinks a lot of milk. And we presented this campaign and um, we, had a, we had on the table in front of us something to symbolize the marketing challenge, which was you know, doorstep delivery was going down. So we had a, we'd made a doorstep, there was a doorstep, there was a milk bottle, and an empty milk bottle. And at a key moment during my summing up, and I said, if you appoint white Colin Rutherford Scott, no abbreviations in those days, um, and I pressed a button and the milk started coming, your milk sales will rise, and up came the milk. And it rose, and it rose, and it rose, and it rose. But the bloody thing had been overfilled, so suddenly milk is going all over the bloody table. And we're out there with the tissues, trying to stop it getting into the farmer's laps and all the rest of it. Total, absolute nightmare. Anyhow, um, we, didn't, um, we didn't win that pitch. <laughs> but every problem being an opportunity in disguise, uh, a few months later, we won a beer. We won a beer called Carlin Black Label, and we won it without a creative pitch. Um, and we said to, to Ron Collins, look, Ron, you're the, you're the king of beers. Could you just do it another, another Heineken, please? And you know, Ron um, you know, had various ideas and various celebrities, and they weren't any good. And you know, two days before the pitch, we got right to look, we got nothing, no, nothing whatsoever. And Andrew said, well, look, you know, what about that line, I bet he drinks a lot of milk? What about, I bet he drinks Carlin Black Label? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> hold on, where have we got to now? Yeah. There we are. So that's where this came from. It's, it's, a, it's a milk, it's a milk commercial. <laughs> So the lesson there is, if you've got a good line in your pitch, you can use it again if you don't win. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Robin, just, just looking at, obviously you've, you've nurtured WSOS for many a decade. How has pitching, do you think, shaped the culture of the agency? And how do you, when you lose, how do you, how do you pick an agency up from, from a loss of a big pitch? Well, a couple of things. First of all, um, in preparing myself for this, I actually found um, a couple of pitch closing things that I'd done and pitch, you know, bits of actual pitches. And I, and I think the, f the first point about the culture of the agency is that I always thought that, and I still think, WTRS is very much um, the SAS, not the Brigade of Guards. Uh, and that's the culture. And this, and this is some from Marx I read out. Um, anyhow, really, you know, we move fast, we think fast, we don't take prisoners, blah blah blah. Uh, so I think that. So I think that's a new business culture should be like that. And I think that's what's exciting about it. And I think um, in terms of when you have to pick yourself up, I think this it, it certainly helps to be insensitive. Uh, so you mean, you know, it, it, I think it helps because you know, and you just have to. You know, you just have to, and that's the nature of this business. 
you know, you're, you're going to lose a lot of pitches and you're going to win some. And you just have to look for the next one, look for the opportunity, um, and you have, to, you, know, you have to keep on going for it. Um, and I, that's one thing I, know, I love about you know, the WSRS spirit has always been with it. You know, we've had our ups and we have our downs, but we've, we've always had this really determination. And, uh, you know, and, and that, you know, that's why I'm really proud of that film, particular film, for example. So I think that having that, that bounce, that energy, and you know, when you know, we get young people coming in, they, they get whipped up in it as well. So if, if you can have that SAS spirit in your agency uh, and not you know, get... And I think it's happening much more. I think digital has changed things. You know, people are much faster, much quicker. We make things... You know, whole, the whole process has speeded up. I think that's much... makes business much more fun. And, you know, and if you lose... Um, I mean, you've got, you know, you've got, you know, you've got to t try not to lose. Because you know it is disappointing, so you just have to you have to do it. Can you train yourself to be like that? I've seen you in a bar honing in on a client before they've even thought they should call a pitch, <laughs> and you're there, and you've got a little brochure tucked up your sleeve, and you're waving it in front of. Them. Can you train yourself to be that positive and relentless well, about it? Well, it's not that. I love WCRS. And I love engine, and I really believe they're better things. And you know, I'd like to take this client out of his misery, being in a second-rate <laughs> solution. <laughs> how has your how has pitching changed since you've become part of this sort of integrated culture at Engine? Has that changed the way you um, approach the pitch? Yeah, I think it has in a number of yes, it has, because I mean, you know, other agents, you know, we don't, you know, we can now say to a client, don't give us a brief, give us a problem. You know, so we can say to clients, look, you know, we've got a, a full toolkit, not just a partial toolkit. Um, and you know, if WTF is pitching, for example, it can call in even you know, all sorts of inputs and expertise and things. And I think that's that really, you know, really has improved. Um, and you know, and it's great. And WTF can contribute to other other companies. So I think, you know, I think I think it's a much it's a much more exciting palette. You know, you're painting a picture, you know, with all the colours of the rainbow, not just some of them. But despite all this talent under the engine roof, they still call upon you to get your pitch magic out. Well, I'm, I hope that the, the, the day they stop doing that, I should be disappointed. You know, I, you know, I love doing it. You know, and I can work behind the scenes. I can work in front of the scenes. You know, as I said, it's uh, you know my 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 advertising autobiography, uh, which I did for Radio Four, was called the, mo the most fun you can have with your clothes on, and you know, uh, and, the, uh, and 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 you can. The most fun part of it is new business. I, you know, I'm better at new business than existing business. And am I right in thinking you might have a nice, neat slide of tips? Yes, I have. Um, th but this, this is, um, I don't know if you can see, you, don't worry about these. This, this is just sort of interesting. We did some work for Corinthia, which was an engine pitch. So oh, okay. it, it just was, a, and then it, we, we couldn't have done it if we hadn't. Let's just go through to the very end. Because, so, I can't. So basically, you can see I wrote this in 1984. Uh, but who wasn't alive in 1984 oh, in this no. room? <laughs> so, and and I I thought I, it would be more interesting to show that rather than just give current. So I wrote and it said spend more time with the clients than the other agencies. And it may not be possible always to do that. But I really think if you possibly can, you build the relationships, you pick up vibrations, you, you pick, pick up facts. If you can just sort of stay with me, not just read all of them. Um, um, and also go to different levels inside the client. Again, most people are probably doing this. But I just want to point out, I said it in 1984, so I'm, I'm the sort of smart new business Alec. Um, <laughs> Number two, investigating the product. And I, I didn't write the word interrogating the product till, till 85. Um, but so that's what was then called investigating. And, you know, particularly finding out something, and it's still, it's still really worth trying to do. And this is something which I, we, we used to do in 84. Make sure you show the weaknesses in the strategies we're not recommending. So we used to work out what the other alternative strategies and machine gun them. Um, and particularly, you know, um, and, and, and we're, because, you know, the, the client will be looking for alternatives, other agencies will be, so it, it can help if, you've, if you kill the, recommend, the other strategies. 
Uh, four, the trade can be as important as the consumer. Uh, again, most agencies will talk to the trade, but get down around the trade, um, talk to you know junior, get, get, get a rep to take you around. Who knows what you're going to find off from a rep? Might be interesting perspectives on the company. Uh, this is a complicated one, number five. The proposition must sell the agency as well as the products. Um, we didn't do creative ads in those days. So this was about the proposition. So how could we find something that sold the agency as well as the product? This is st still applies. Show how we've already solved similar problems working for our existing clients. I'm sure uh, everyone in this room does that as well. Um, we, we, we won't say what we will do, but we will say what we won't do. Is it, in other words, saying what is wrong again seemed to us a good thing at the time. Again, remember, we're not showing any creative work. So you're trying to win the pitch with theatre, you know, with, with as much, you know, you don't have the creative idea. So maybe uh, work out not only what is the, what is the right solution, but what the client is looking for again. And, and realise they're two different things sometimes, and you can hold them, and, and then what, because you don't win the, the pitch, but you won't have a chance to do what is right. But, and I think as that example uh, showed on Safe Store, you know, the client was very good, and we, thought, we think he's a brilliant client, but, you know, and, uh, and we responded along the way and came up with the right ad. Um, consider carefully the strengths of the agencies, which, it should be who, are opposing us. Uh, can do <laughs> who wrote this stuff? I mean, obviously an obvious point, you know, what are, the, you know, what are their strengths? Why they might they be chosen? Why would they be preferred to us? The difference between winning and losing could be 1%, could be 5%. So why might they prefer us? What, is, what relationships might they have that we don't know? You know uh, don't forget to sell the team hard. And this is a, a line. We, the early days of WCRS, uh, the best unknown car in the market, the best unknown beer in the market. In other words, we, where you've got a good product and it's not well known, that was a, a, a strategy, a line that lots of clients liked and um, signed up for. And, uh, you know, probably the most important thing is genuine enthusiasm. And they really feel that you love them, that that love will last beyond a pitch, that you'll see them, that it's not just a new business hitch te a pitch team. Um, and do all that, and you have a good chance. That's fantastic. We've seen lots of enthusiasm from you tonight, Robin. And now it's your turn to do some work and show some enthusiasm. I'd love you to ask Robin some questions, please, because I've done my fill. Hi there. Yeah, I need, you probably can't hear me from 10 feet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's more about uh, you as a creative. Um, you're talking about memes and archaeology bringing back lines. Um, what's your opinion on originality? Because creatives are usually really desperate not to be seen to be doing things that have been done before. Mm. And if someone says, oh, I've seen that ad, you, it crushes you. So how do you, what's your opinion on that? Mm. It's a very big and difficult issue. <coughs> what, what um, and I've invented this rather clumsy phrase called differentiated continuity. Uh, and what the brain wants is more of the same. And what the creative team is something different to build a reputation with. And finding a way to manage those two things uh, is quite tricky. And that's why I'm very, very proud, for example, of what we've done with, with Churchill, because it has all the freshness of a completely new idea, uh, yet it has you know, a lot in the, in, the, in the bank of the brain. Um, and I think you know, sometimes it's much harder for the creatives not to have a blank sheet of paper, and they should be encouraged not to have a blank sheet of paper, and be made to, that there's a, a there's some, there's an asset that needs to be um, brought to life and kept alive. But it's so, you know sometimes you want something completely different. But it, the, I think that you always want something that is cut through and that is freshness. But if you throw away a property, um, and I think too many are thrown away. That there's a dustbin, a rubbish bump, and I mentioned orange, and I mentioned carnival orange in particular. You know, it is the greatest scandal. If I was a shareholder of Orange, I'd say, why have you done this? Does that an answer to your question? It does, thank you. More questions, Toby? Uh, just as an idea, same as planning. Uh, do you think that planning can get in the way on pitches? Because it sounds like a lot of what you've done is just going, just going to the factory, going to see yourself, no. you know, experiencing it firsthand. So what's your, what's your view of um, 
planning in the, in the context of the pitch? Well, um, I've often seen myself as a sort of planner, and I think that's one of the roles of planning. I don't see the planner's role as just interrogating consumers. I see the planner's role as interrogating products. So, um, um, and I see, and I think the, the planner you know, has, a, has a huge role in a pitch in terms of understanding the market, understanding the consumers, coming up with insights, working with the creative people. I don't see, you know, I think a good planner never gets in the way of anything. A bad planner gets in the way of everything. More questions? Okay, we'll go with the lady first. Thank you. Hello. Do you have any tips or experience of when a pitch presentation goes horribly wrong, you're dying on your arse, essentially? How do you get out of it? When the pitch is, when you're dying in the pitch? <coughs> Gosh. Um, I only remember the good ones. Uh, Trying to remember where we. Um, I can't. Sitting here now, I'm sure there have been some absolute nightmares, but the way my brain works, they, it hoovers them away. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, it. Um, I, I, mean, I, I, I mean, again, you. Part of the thing about a pitch is. I mean, first of all, the clients normally. I mean, I. So clients not, it's seldom get, you may feel it's not going well, and you may feel uh, you're not winning it, but the client's not going to be rude to you, particularly now the button-down client that they've come from, they've been trained by the, um, the, the uh, consultants is to behave properly and not say anything. Um, so they're not allowed to say anything most of the time. Um, and then the agency, we're all s hyped up with adrenaline. You know, so you know, we're going to go for it you know, whatever happened. So, um, I mean, I, I'm trying to think of, I can think of moments which went right, but not went, I'll give you one which went right, because it was quite, quite in, <coughs> because I mean, the question is, are you, if, if the client asks you an awkward question, uh, how would you respond to it? It's not quite your question. And when we were pitching <coughs> for um, what became 118118, it was actually at that step, uh, the, the client had got the number 118811, so he didn't have the, the number he eventually had, a guy called Robert Pines. And we did this pitch, the strategic pitch, 118811, got it all, you know, we were all organised, and this very smart American <coughs> client says, well, that's very impressive, Robin, and uh, I'm going to be spending £14 million pounds on this, but if I could get the number 118118, uh, and spend £3 million pounds on that, do you think that would be a good use of my money? So I said, well, that's a really interesting question, Robert. Um, and you know, I'd just like to th think about that for you know, a little bit and come back to you. And I looked, and he, and, and I said, and he said, well, you've got um, 20 seconds, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at the, this very brilliant planner um, on my left, uh, Cameron Saunders, and, and I thought he was sort of winking or saying, making me thought it was a good idea. So I said, yep, that would be a great idea. And then what he then did, he took out his mobile phone, went literally outside the door, and he rang three young guys in, in Reading who'd got that number in the lottery uh, and bought that number, 118118, over the phone, outside up that door for three million pounds. <laughs> so that's not quite a thing going wrong, but it's, when it, it's something which went very right. But you know the, the point I would make is that again, act if you feel that something, I suppose if if, if the guy, client didn't like it, would you, would you what would you say then? I'm not quite sure really in answer to your question, but I sort of stumbled away to a non-answer. <laughs> <laughs> there was another question somewhere. Yeah, um, I, I was once told that as soon as a pitch is finished, you should start acting like you're their agency. Mm. Um, and, we, and we've tried that and it's worked really well so they appreciate your enthusiasm and goodwill but we've also tried it and you just end up feeling like you're a bit of an irritant to the client so I just wondered what your thoughts are on what you should do after the pitch is finished well uh, I would say the pitch isn't finished till you've been told you've got it or you haven't got it yeah, that, that's what I mean. Between the, the end of your presentation and when the result is... Yeah, well, I think you should 
do things, you know, various sorts of things you should do to follow up of different sorts. I mean, I, you know, I, I used to do little videos um, it, which, which summarized, you know, the, the presentation and responded to various points that the client had raised and then send that video down to them. So there's a, there's a range of things you can do. I can't give you all our secrets, or we... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you should, you should, I don't, I think, you, you know, it's a delicate balance between annoying people and, you know, and just making, they feel you don't care. And I think you've got to f just show that you are, you know, you are still enthusiastic and finding ways to communicate one way or the other as best you can. And, you know, it depends if there's consultants involved, it's, you know, it's more complicated than that. But yeah, I think you should do your best to show enthusiasm, insight, enthusiasm. More questions? I'll go at the back first. Hi, Robin. Um, Hi. What was the best pitch idea you had which you weren't able to donate to another client? <laughs> oh, goodness me. Um, the best pitch idea that we had, what, what, in the actual creative idea or the sort of pitch theater? Which no, the creative idea. Um, well, possibly, though it didn't work out, uh, didn't work out that great, uh, that it should have done, was, and it was actually the biggest pitch we ever won, I think, was one of the biggest we ever won in, as a pitch. Um, because we, so we, we won orange without a creative pitch, so these things don't count. But we pitched for um, Camelot, um, and we um, came up with the, uh, it was a, a great pitch, um, and had a great, a great um, I thought a great line, and a great, uh, which was maybe, just maybe, and we, we actually made, first, any, uh, any time we ever done, we actually made a pitch film. We, we made a rough film uh, for it. And they all said that the hairs on the back of their neck tingled. Uh, and that was a good sign that we might win. So, but then what then happened was, we had this line, as soon as we won the pitch, they wanted completely different sorts of advertising. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and they wanted promotional this and promotional that. And it was so sad, because so we never did ads after the pitch as good as the one we did in the pitch. Right. Um, what was number eight? Well done, let's have a look. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Obviously, I, you know, I'm... <laughs> yeah. going back? I don't know. Isn't it? What's, what's, what's the hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'll just see, is it on here? No, it's not on here either. <laughs> so I'm intrigued too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what the, yeah, I don't know what the missing number eight is. Well, miss, well number eight coming, come your time is up. <laughs> I know. You, you were here when we did all this, yeah. weren't you? Yeah, yeah see, yeah. Well, let's see, there we are. Mm. Is there, a, there was another question at the back there. Okay. You, can, you can produce Hi. with your microphone. <laughs> so, um, so obviously pitching is an expensive business, and I was wondering whether or not how you sort of go in terms of managing your spend a bit. Is it just whatever it takes, or do you sit there and plot your costs before you get moving, or, I don't know, do you come down when all the team's there and going, actually, we're going to tweak that film, and we're going to do this? Or how, how do you set your budgets, or...? Um, I can tell you one thing about me, that I'm let nowhere near a budget. <laughs> <laughs> I'm let nowhere near a budget, uh, uh, and which is absolutely right. Uh, so I might have ideas, we might have ideas, and there'll be other people who decide how much should be invested in that. Okay. And, I think, and I think, you know, you have to manage it very carefully. Yeah. So I don't, you know, basically, um, Spend as you know much as, as you can for as little as you can, and now we've got a lot of stuff in house at Engine. We can do much more for less. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Not Thank much you. of an answer, but. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? One here. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm just wondering what you think it is in the um, a client's kind of working life where 
it seems to be much harder to sell uh, an original, inspiring idea than it is to sell an idea that looks and feels like advertising. What's, what, what's gone wrong there? Well, two or three things would, would, will happen there. Um, I mean, first of all, you know, we're all wired up, you and me and the client, to avoid risk. So we're wired up to avoid risk for a whole string of evolutionary reasons I could explain to you afterwards. Um, secondly, um, we're wired up to like more of the same. So our brain uh, actually takes twice as much brain effort to learn something new as to practice a, a task it's already learned. So that's likely to get you know, more of the same sort of advertising. Um, and thirdly, uh, you know, inside a, a corporate structure, who wants to take you know, the risk and step out of line um, and be the one, you know, nobody gets you know, all you know, the IBM sort of remark. So I think there's a lot of pressures. Um, and the guy who is the radical guy uh, you know, it's a hard place to be, and he and he may not be in the driving, you know, the top. I mean, too often, you know, the top guy can be smart, um, but there's lots of sort of you know filtering people. They can all say no, and none can say yes. So I think there's a lot of pressures. Um, and if you think of all the research processes, you know, frankly, I would say some of the best work we do, uh, you know, of which you know, Safe Tour is an example comes out when you've got fewer of all these processes. And I think lots of these clients are very nice guys, you know, but they're, they've, you know, they've, got lots of, they've also got a lot of other things in their lives. Any client, I mean, you know, even the advertising manager will be doing lots of other things, but the marketing doing lots of other things. It's not, it's not top of their pile. Is that a sort of answer? Yeah, yeah, I think that's, I agree with all those reasons. <laughs> Anyone else got any more questions? Hi, Robin. Um, you say Engine's uh, an integrated agency. Mm -hmm. um, clients come to you with a problem that you can solve. With all the different skill sets under one roof, who do you invite to that first pitch meeting? Mm. Well, uh, we've got some very smart people to decide. I mean, sometimes people come straight to WTS or come straight to jam that I mean, quite a lot of people come straight to an individual company so uh, but you know, but we will look at our assessment uh, of what the issues are you know what are the issues and you, you, you won't just get you'll get some piece of paper you'll get some documents saying that this is our issue um, and, and we'll then look at what those issues are um, and and have a core meeting of, of what we're going to do so we'll well you know, it's, it's an assessment and then that assessment can change as we get to know who they are. And, and who's the we? Uh, Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you all so much. I guarantee one thing. If the IPA does Pitching Legends series in 20 years' time, Robin will still be here. <laughs> he will still be a leading Pitching Legend. Thank you so much. I hope you'll find that useful.